welcome friends to this session this evening or whatever time of day it is for you um, we can start as usual uh, with a guided meditation and uh, we'll sit together for about 30 minutes and I'd like to offer some guidance just to begin the meditation session so uh, please make yourselves comfortable and uh, we can uh, enjoy the chance to come into the body to come to the simple reality of body sitting body in whatever posture you find yourself in and uh, just to begin to attend to the way it is, the way it feels, what we can experience right now. Maybe experiencing the temperature in the space, hot or cold, or anything in between, and the body heat, coolness in different parts of the body, experiencing the weight of the body, the earth element, simple sense of gravity, our attraction to this earth, our heaviness, the pressure of the body touching the ground or the mat or the floor, the chair. <clears throat> Coming into these very simple, apparent realities here for us in this moment. And in doing this, of course, we're letting go, we're announcing the world we're letting go of any kind of action, any kind of volition, letting go of thinking, planning, all the cogitation is to allow that to not be our main focus of attention, but just to be so peacefully, simply aware of body sitting. And how is it? How does it feel? Where do we feel and what? And we don't need to name or label our experience at all, but just to focus our energy, our attention on what can be felt in this present experience. And so we're developing stillness, developing samadhi, moment by moment, the mind body can come to a simpler, a more still state. Now we can breathe deep, release any tension in the body, really landing, really settling into the posture. And notice change. Notice how things are moving and shifting. Notice the change from when we first started meditating, just in this one session. There's a kind of you know, dropping, releasing, relaxing, 
or a, a noticing of what's going on that may not have been apparent at the beginning just minutes ago things reveal themselves we can inquire or we can simply notice oh this is how it is oh this is what's happening when everything else is put aside it's the still small voice that's often ignored voices from the body from the heart it's like, how, how is it how is it really what's really going on And as we keep paying attention, we can see the change as things arise and pass. And there's a kind of fading out of one experience after another. There's a sense of stripping away, stripping away layers of perception thought formations, ideas, obsessions, feelings. As we continue to simply observe, <clears throat> see how they shift and change. And there's this yeah, sense of stripping away, things falling away. it's like diving deeper into reality seeing what's here so I'd like to encourage you to pay attention to a sense of impermanence a sense of constant change the experience the flow Nothing static here, nothing permanent, nothing that stays just the same. It's a very helpful way to practice, to observe Anicca. Anicca Sanya, bring up the perception of impermanence and see how it can be Applied, see how it manifests in every experience, watching the comings and goings, the arisings and passings, and so the mind can, the chitta, the heart can flow with reality, not getting caught up in any particular experience but flowing with reality we can pay attention pay attention to change pay attention to this flow this process ever shifting impermanent field of experience we can sit together for about 20 minutes. I'll ring the gong at the end.
and hello again friends <clears throat> greetings and I uh, hope that those of you who are sitting um, together with us have a good meditation and uh, this reflection on impermanence um, such a helpful way to pay attention uh, to the med in meditation practice and of course it also in life. So I'd like to say a few words on Dharma, but first I'll pay respects to the Buddha Dharma and Sangha. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sambuddhasa Anamo tassa bhagavato arahato sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Buddha in the mind sang and the Masami. So today is um, quite a special day in the Buddhist calendar. It's um, Vasalaha Puja, which is the full moon. Of July and um, this is the uh, day before the start of the Vasa of the three months rains retreat for the nuns and monks and um, traditionally you know in India the time of the Buddha um, this was the time when the monastics, the wanderers, would uh, make a determination to stay in one place for the duration of the monsoon season uh, so that, you know, the crops that were growing in the rains, this fertile time of the year, uh, would not be disturbed, <laughs> wouldn't get trampled. Uh, wouldn't be damaged by the uh, wandering mendicants like the nuns and uh, spiritual practitioners who are were homeless wanderers and so we make a determination uh, to this day at this time of year um, with monastics Theravadan Buddhist monastics decide where they're going to spend the next three months and determine their place of practice so that we're not moving around as much. And like Bhante Sadaso, Ayasoma, Bhante Sumita, sorry if I got that wrong, and uh, friends uh, have been wandering on Tudong in Italy. Um, and I've been myself I'm up in Canada in a small monastery in the Rockies and uh, I'm about to move down to monastery in California Damadarini and practice there for the Vasa period so we all need to choose a place and arrive hopefully in time for the start of the Vasa and settle for three months. It doesn't mean that we can't go for walks, uh, move around um, in nature, but we're just not doing so much of the traveling, longer distance traveling, to long practice. Uh, not so much of that at this time. And it's traditionally a time when we have a chance to be together uh, in maybe larger numbers than usual, maybe coming together in more settled, larger communities, and we can take the opportunity then to look at the, the new rules, study our precepts, and uh, also 
uh, take a chance to speak on Dharma together, to study the words of the Buddha, uh, the teachings of the Buddha, and yeah, have a chance to talk about our practice and practice together. So it's quite a special occasion in the Buddhist calendar. Uh, traditionally, it would have been a time of retreat. Well, in quite a few countries where Buddhism has spread, it's not actually a monsoon time, as we know. It's more like a summer holidays and can be quite a, in a way, busy time for monasteries with people having time, you know, to come and visit and practice kind of holiday period. So <clears throat> it can be a time of retreat, but it also can be a time of actually making opportunities for people to come and visit the monasteries and do retreats and have lay retreats and people coming to practice as guests and visitors to monasteries. And we can have usually monastics have retreat time um, in the winter, more often in the winter in Western countries when it's it is actually quieter and the nature is more you know, also quiet and uh, more peaceful in many ways uh, and uh, it's not so conducive for people to come visit so the retreat time is not always in this period of time, this Vasa period, but it, it can be a period of time for a lot of communal group uh, gatherings and opportunities for practicing together. <clears throat> anyway, what I'm really reflecting on today and uh, what I mentioned in the guided meditation uh, is uh, Anicca Sanya change <laughs> and I think for me because I'm just about to move from one country to another from one monastery to another from one situation to another and uh, I find it quite interesting how the mind doesn't really move into the future so much um, as we practice we tend to be more rooted in the present moment and so these big changes, change of location, or big changes that can happen in life, you know, when people pass away or we turn from being healthy into having some kind of diagnosis, some kind of illness, big changes that happen um, can often, you know, come unexpectedly. Um, and not really register until they're happening, until they're actually happening, or until after they've happened, in a way. Um, the real experience of change is, is a constant experience for us in the present. And uh, I find that, yeah, through meditation practice, the sense of change is something different. It's not so much about <clears throat> the big changes that happen, but it's noticing the constant flow of experience, how that is uh, never static, never solid, always flowing. And, um, and it's interesting that when we really pay attention to this reality of impermanence, moment by moment, uh, the big changes are almost uh, more seamless more natural for us it's not such a, a jarring shocking uh, event when some big change comes along because we've had uh, training in noticing the reality of impermanence uh, on a daily on a moment by moment basis so it it, it, it no longer takes us by surprise when big shifts happen, sudden disappearances of loved ones or sudden change in our circumstances physically or uh, geographically moving around, 
having to say goodbye to people and so forth it's uh, in a way if we're really kind of waking up to the reality of a nature of impermanence we recognize don't we that we're we're always saying goodbye to people <laughs> every time we part do we know that we're going to meet them again well no we, we can't really know that um it's a, it's this could be it you know and we often say things don't we like see you later see you soon <laughs> bye for now <laughs> and that's natural because you know um, it is realistic to maybe assume that if we have a neighbour we're likely to see them again uh, one day, next day, day after and so on but we never know, we never know and um, even though we might use these kind of colloquial figures of speech, ways of speaking to one another we can recognise as practitioners that yeah uh, the reality is uh, something different and when we meet again it's not really the same people meeting again it's always different because we're changing and they're changing and everything's changing right? and constantly changing so we never meet the same people again uh, and we're not we're not a constant um, reliable unchanging phenomenon on the contrary <laughs> we're constantly shifting and changing and the beauty of you know developing this perception of change this opening to the reality of change uh, is that you know we we can free up uh, from our expectations about others and free up um, our thoughts and feelings and assumptions about ourselves also you know we're not uh, definable we can't pigeonhole ourselves <laughs> really uh, we're as unpredictable um, as anyone else um, but, and what we practice isn't it easier to understand this to perceive this because we can see how isn't it when we pay attention to the body um, pay attention to this mind, these emotions, we can see how they're really not in our control and we don't really know what's coming next. And I, I don't know about you, but I can certainly be taken by surprise. Uh, thoughts, memories, feelings that arise seemingly out of the blue. Um, and our, our work really is not to try and always figure out what's going on, why things are happening, but simply to be you know, willing to open to that and allow this kind of free flow of experience to be what it is. Uh, when we have thoughts and expectations about who we are, assumptions and ideas about what kind of a person we are, then we're almost like limiting reality, we're closing it down, aren't we? You know, we're um, kind of putting ourselves in a box, literally, <laughs> pigeonholing, categorizing, assuming um, this is a kind of perpetual state. And, you know, sure enough, if we have this kind of mental attitude, then this is what we create for ourselves and we are limited uh, and there's no real room for change to manifest. So it's really opening the mind and each asana, perception of impermanence is really allowing ourselves to open up to the kind of almost infinite possibilities. Uh, reality is very rich and very, you know, multi, multi-hued, varied. Um, there's a multiplicity of possibilities, and uh, we don't want to get caught up in seeking to discover more and more and more about reality. No, but simply to be present 
with what is, with what arises, and to allow uh, the extraordinary uh, way uh, things move in nature, the natural unfolding of reality to be experienced. And uh, so this Anicca Sanya I find very valuable as a, um, a contemplation, as a way of relating to our experience in meditation, um, the way we can pay attention to the body and just uh, see the change, feel the change, the way the breath is constantly changing, the way thoughts are arising and passing um, incredibly rapidly. Um, we're all over the place with thinking constant change, constant flow, and also the emotions when we're really allowing uh, the flow of energy in the body, in the mind, we can see how uh, the emotional world is very changeable also. <laughs> Feelings arising like bubbles, the Buddha said, you know, popping, and then another one comes, it's like a fizzy drink, like my Coke I've got here. <laughs> the feelings are, you know, coming and going so fast. And if we can, you know, keep a, keep away from uh, grasping and holding to any particular experience, then it really allows uh, this reality. And, and, and things move through us. Dhammas move through us. They move, simply. And we can observe this reality and um, just keep letting go, letting go, flowing with reality rather than grasping any particular aspect of reality and trying to make it solid, trying to make it lasting and permanent. We're doomed to fail if we do this and not only that but it's suffering, it's big suffering because whenever we try to move away from reality and control our experience, it's very painful for us and it's a huge effort as well to do that. So we can relax, lie back, it's like lying on a, a lilo or one of those body, the, like, or a kayak or <laughs> some sort of board that floats, a canoe or a raft, lying on it, you know, and just letting the current take us, you know, with skill. You know, we can make right effort to steer a little bit here and there, but basically uh, we can watch what's unfolding. If there are unskillful thoughts and painful feelings arising, um, we want to really pay attention to them. And it's almost like we want to steer a little bit, we want to be very careful. Um, the Buddha said it's like a cow herder, isn't it, in the, in the monsoon season. When the monks and nuns are all avoiding uh, trampling the crops, the cow herder has to watch the cows very carefully to make sure that they don't damage other farmers or their own crops. Um, when we have unskillful mind states arising, well, okay, we want to be very careful not to, you know, follow them, not to grasp them, not to make them um, any more than they are and as to allow them to arise and pass um, in their own way and, you know, have a hands-off approach, but care can be required. Uh, when the thoughts, feelings, experiences are skillful or neutral, then we can sit back like the cow herder at the end of the harvest. We can sit back and just allow the cows to roam freely, grazing here and there. So there's a certain amount of effort at times that's required to steer carefully, steer away from danger, avoid waterfalls, crocodiles, whirlpools and such like. Be aware of the danger of negative or very passionate states of mind, not that they're uh, to be suppressed or crushed or ignored or, you know, uh, no, we can we can allow 
uh, difficult mind states to arise, but we want to be very vigilant and not hold on to them in any way, not to make more of them, just allow them to be seen, to be understood. And in, in understanding suffering, of course, we can let it go, see, see things, uh, follow their natural course, arise and pass away. So these are just a few thoughts about um, practice in terms of uh, nature, change. The Buddha said, you know, that um, if we develop this perception of change, of impermanence in our practice and in our lives, you know, in our everyday lives, it's not difficult to see the constant change that's going on around us and within us and we can just keep noticing that you know um, the Buddha said there are great advantages to be had in um, contemplating change in these ways there's a sutta a beautiful sutta in the Kandaka section of um, Samyutta Nikaya the Kanda section uh, section on the aggregates a huge chapter so many teachings on the five khandas and there's one of the suttas is uh, anicca sanya sutta and here the buddha uh, tells us about the advantages of paying attention to impermanence and uh, he says in this sutta that uh, there are five uh, benefits that we can experience when we direct our attention to impermanence, to our nature, to change. And he said the first thing that we can notice is that this reduces our attachment to sense pleasures. And we can see why uh, that would be the case. Because if we're, you know, noticing how fleeting, you know, how transient, how uh, insubstantial sense pleasures actually are, then we are much less likely to get caught up in pursuing you know, more pleasure, more of the same, uh, endless kind of pursuit for very little gain. Uh, we have a beautiful, delicious meal. Well, it's over, you know, in a matter of minutes. Uh, we could maybe span it out to an hour or two if we were really relishing and sort of um, making the most of every mouthful but uh, nevertheless no meal lasts very long and uh, so why make a big fuss about getting uh, this food or that food you know it's so it's such a tiny part of our day why make it more important than it is it's a way to nourish the body, fuel the body, bring energy to the body so we can continue to practice. But more than that, um, we're, you know, just getting lost in suffering. Because if we pursue, you know, uh, sense pleasures in relation to tastes and smells, then we inevitably, uh, we're disappointed because the more we promote these kind of desires, the more they grow. And they're kind of insatiable, aren't they? We can really notice that. It's like when people get into eating disorders, it's like you can never quite have enough, you know, or sometimes you can never quite deprive yourself enough. Um, very painful um, obsessions we can have around food and around eating. But if we have a good understanding and practice around anicca sanya, seeing the impermanence of these pleasures, the, the fleeting nature of taste, you know, um, we, we really can become quite cool around food, we can be quite detached in a good way, you know, we can be grateful for the food that we're offered or that we're able to procure for ourselves, but we don't spend more time than necessary in its kind of preparation and consumption. Uh, 
in the same way, you know, with any kind of entertainment or delightful pursuit, <laughs> we can appreciate if we are aware of impermanence how nothing really lasts. We can't really do anything for very long. Um, we're constantly having to rest, change postures, go to the toilet, um, you know, that there's interruptions um, <laughs> and no pleasurable pursuit can be followed indefinitely. And if we were to try to prolong pleasure, what happens, of course, is it turns into pain. So anything we do, eating too much, uh, walking too much, watching too much TV, playing too many video games, if we do too much of anything at all that we like to do, it becomes painful for us. We get uncomfortable, we get unhealthy, we get kind of drained, you know. And so again, it's it's seeing how insubstantial sense pleasures are through an Nietzsche Sanya that we can really notice that our attachment, our um, gravitating towards sense pleasures, it begins to diminish. And we're that much freer, we're that much more contented. We, we notice, we can notice that we're more contented and more peaceful simply to be present in each moment. So the second benefit the Buddha said to practicing perception of anicca is that we also uh, develop uh, a, a reduction, a diminishing in our desire for rebirth, for rebirth. So this is the, the, the ways in which we project into the future are diminished, diminishing through an Icha Sanya, because we can see how, uh, you know, unpredictable the future is. Whatever plans we make, whatever thoughts we have about the future, um, subject to change. <laughs> you know, unreliable, uncertain. And this is an aspect of Anicca Sanya, of the uh, perception of impermanence. Nothing's really very easy to predict. Nothing's easy to control. Um, things happen in their own way. And so the sense of wanting to project into the future, wishing for more uh, life, existence, happenings, um, fruits of plans, um, ambition, you know, um, all the kind of uh, future projections that we can indulge in, um, they can really be attenuated, they can start to fade in a good way when we recognize the kind of insubstantial nature, the lack of solidity in our future plans, you know, the uncertainty so again it frees us and it, it helps us to stop moving forward when actually we can only be here <laughs> there's nowhere else we can be uh, when we plan and, and there's nothing wrong with planning like we can we can plan but with this wisdom with this understanding that yep the future is unpredictable it's uncertain i'll make these plans but i won't hold on to them i won't be disappointed if they don't come to pass if they have to be changed one way or another. So another benefit of Anicca Sanya. And the Buddha also said the third benefit is that we can start to let go of our hopes for the future. You know, so this is a painful thing really to project our happiness ahead in time. Um, it's quite poignant for me. Uh, because don't we see so many of us uh, putting a, putting aside um, development, putting aside um, the things that would bring happiness and well-being right now, uh, putting them aside for some future time <laughs> when, you know, I've retired or I've earned enough money or my kids have grown up or whatever. Um, and how often that time actually doesn't come for people. Um, they may pass away before they retire. You know, there may be uh, many different um, happenings that get in the way of 
these future plans and distort and change them and so to hope to project happiness forward into the future is um, a very uh, sad and, and um, in a way unhelpful thing to do rather we you know, we serve better our, this heart, this mind by actually promoting happiness here and now in, uh, investigating and understanding the ways to uh, bring happiness, bring well-being into the heart without delay <laughs> you know, why delay? there's only today, there's only now and um, that's all, the, that's the only place of agency and so when we have a uh, perception of impermanence we're not looking ahead because we never know uh, truly to wisely uh, perceive uh, the change that's our reality is to recognize that we can pass away any moment this could be the last moment we have and it's really wonderful then to actually be here <laughs> to be in this moment not to be looking ahead and putting all our energy into something that doesn't exist, and may not exist, um, cannot exist in a way, no future. And so with the Nietzsche Sanya practice, uh, developing this awareness of change is a constant in our lives. We, we let go, we let go of hopes for the future. We let go of the future um, so we can free ourselves and we can rest more fully and completely in the present. And the fourth benefit, the Buddha said, of cultivating in each asanya is that this it reduces ignorance. This is a way of seeing through ignorance. Um, we have these whipalasa, these distortions of view, the view that we, or the compelling idea that there's somebody here, me, this is me, this is my life. This is a distortion of view. Um, the seeing the beautiful in what is actually not beautiful, but that which is subject to change. And indeed to see permanence where there is only impermanence. So these, these distortions of view um, really uh, cloud the mind. They lead us astray again and again. And they are, you know, it not enabling us to liberate our hearts. They're preventing us from liberating our hearts. And the biggest distortion of view is to see happiness where there is suffering. You know, so we can just just be aware that you know uh, where we take delight, um, the ways in which we seek pleasure, um, we can be looking in the wrong directions, we can be seeking pleasure where really there's always the seed of pain when we seek our pleasures in worldly things uh, because they're not going to last and so this again perception of change is something that can really break through these distortions of view and enable us to see more clearly and to see more clearly, to shatter these illusions is nothing but happiness for us. It's, it's a relief for us to be able to recognize that there's nothing to seek elsewhere. There's nothing to hold on to. There's nothing to grasp. We can, we can be free. We can be free now. We can open up to reality and really take this as a refuge. This is the refuge of Dhamma. And the fifth way, the Buddha said, in which uh, Anicca Sanya um, is a, a kind of illusion shatterer for us, it's a great benefit to us, is that it enables us to let go of the sense of self. So this other distortion of view that I just mentioned, to see self where there is no self, um, to string things together, you know, to join all the dots of experience and create me out of that. Um, this is a source of great suffering and it takes a lot of energy, a lot of effort to keep doing this. And so when we bring in uh, 
perceptions of impermanence, we can apply this to the sense of selfhood, the sense of me and mine, and we can see how uh, this begins to wear away, begins to dissolve for us, and we can let go of all the fears and anxieties, the stress, the suffering of holding to a sense of self. So these five ways in which an Ichasanya perception of impermanence really benefit us on the path um, are worth considering. And I'll just reiterate, recap. A perception of impermanence, an Ichasanya, as a practice for us day by day, it reduces our uh, attachment to sense pleasure, our pursuit of sense pleasure. Uh, can be reduced over time and we can feel more contentment and more peace and happiness in the moment. But our desire for rebirth, um, again, we begin to see through uh, thoughts and wishes for the future and to be able to let them go and also our future hopes, we can begin to let go of attaching to future that is impossible for us to predict or to control. It's the nature sanya reduces ignorance in the mind. So our view becomes straight. We're no longer uh, operating from a distorted view of permanence where there is no permanence. And our sense of self, um, this illusion of me and mine, um, something holding it all together, again can begin to dissolve begin to fade away so we can be freed up and actually start to dwell more fully in the way things are. Ah, oh, what a relief. <laughs> in this sort of the Buddha gave some very beautiful similes also. And he, he said that um, it's like um, a farmer, you know, plowing a field. Um, this uh, perception of impermanence, it's like the plow that cuts through all the growing things, uh, all the things that are, need to be uh, uprooted, destroyed in order for the crop to be planted, um, cuts through all these roots uh, in the same way perception of impermanence cuts through the defilements at the root. We can get to the heart of the matter and let go of delusion, let go of illusion. It's like a reed cutter, the Buddha said, um, shearing the reeds with a scythe, cutting them at the root, cutting them close to the ground in such a way that they can't return. And, you know, gradually over time, if we apply the perception of impermanence to all our experience, uh, we can see, yes, that there's a diminishment of greed, of desire, there's a diminishing of hatred and aversion because we simply can't sustain these energies when we're flowing with reality. We're seeing them arising and passing. We're not holding on to them. And a diminishment of ignorance through seeing things more clearly. The Buddha compared Anicca Sanya to like uh, someone who cuts the stalk of a bunch of mangoes you cut the stalk, all the mangoes will come away as well. So in this way, if we can develop an Icha Sanya, we can see all the defilements are kind of, in a way, attenuated through this awareness. They, they're no longer, uh, they no longer have power over us. We can't be overwhelmed by them when we have foremost in our mind the sense of impermanence, knowing these things don't last, they have no power over us. The Buddha said it's like a um, peak of rafters, a peak of rafters. If we develop an Sanya, it's like we're coming to the peak, um, this perception, looking from this place, we can see the whole structure, it's like the whole construct, the whole building, um, <laughs> of delusion, of illusion, and I refer this myself to, for me it makes me think of the sense of self. The sense of self is like a building that's been constructed and it has all these various parts to it. And if we can come to the ridge pole, to the centerpiece or to the 
peak of the structure and see the whole edifice, then we can start to dismantle it. Underneath your sanya is a very helpful way for us to be able to do this. How can I hold on to a sense of self when it's constantly changing and it's not in my control? I can't make it stay the same. How can I, how can I hold to that as me and mine? Impossible. So to apply the perception of impermanence to our experience of self is a way of dismantling, slowly but surely deconstructing, let the house builder cease and allow the house to fall apart. The Buddha said again, in each asanya, this perception of impermanence, it's like the best of fragrant roots. It's like the best of heartwoods, the strongest of heartwoods, the most fragrant of flowers. He said it's like the greatest of kings, the righteous king, world ruler. He said it's like the radiance of the moon, how the radiance of the moon eclipses, over, overwhelms the radiance of the stars. Far in the distance, little pinpricks of stars where the moon shines forth so much more powerful for us here on earth. This Anicca Sanya is like the moon that can outshine all the thoughts, feelings, perceptions, permanence, um, all the delusory ways in which we're um, viewing the world. And he said, finally, uh, Anicca Sanya is like the sun shining in a clear sky after a rain, and the sky is clear and everything is fresh and um, the sun comes out and beams its rays around and illuminates the whole scene in this way, he said, our perceptions of impermanence are able to illuminate our experience. If we can direct this uh, understanding to all of our experience, then we're able to really uh, see clearly uh, with great clarity and gain insight, gain wisdom. Um, so these are just some, it's a short summary of this Anicca Samya Sutta, Samyata Nikaya, chapter 22, the chapter on Kandas, beautiful Sutta, um, and the benefit of this practice. Um, so I hope these words can be helpful for you. And I uh, wish everybody every blessing in their practice. Very well. So we have a little bit of time. Uh, I'd like to say hi to everybody again and thank you for your comments and messages in the chat box. I'm going to have a little look, see what I can see if there's any questions at all. Thank you, Sid. Um, got a question here from Sid. Um, dear Aya, can we share our merit with another person so that that person will have all the benefit and hopefully will have a good outcome for their situation? Or is this just wishful thinking? Yeah, thank you very much, Sid. Um, it's a really beautiful question and consideration. Um, because isn't it the case that we we so want to share our well-being and to see others um, situations improving to see others happy and well and this is such a beautiful way of relating to others um, you know way of relating to the suffering in the world and um, my sense is that uh, yeah, in the Buddhist tradition, um, in the Buddhist world, it's very much um, the case that people will uh, make offerings, do good, um, consciously make merit and share uh, the blessings of this goodness and the happiness that results from generosity um, with anyone that they want to bring to mind 
it's oftentimes, isn't it? People will make um, donations, perform good acts, offer dana to the monks and nuns in memory of uh, somebody who's passed away or for the benefit of somebody who is struggling, um, suffering, who's unwell, or who has some uh, challenges that they're having to deal with. And um, my sense is that, uh, you know, the truth of not self shows us that uh, we know that um, there's no kind of real individuality here as a collective. Um, and in a way, you know, we are most definitely able to bring uh, good or harmful, skillful or unskillful thoughts, words and deeds into the field um, around us and we can benefit or we can harm, um, you know, and so we have a choice and if we want to support others we can certainly support them best by practicing well ourselves uh, living a good life avoiding harm and purifying our hearts purifying our minds from all suffering uh, this process of practice for liberation is the greatest um, offering that we can make we can also make material offerings and yeah, we can dedicate uh, for the benefit of any particular people that we have in our hearts, we want to consider them and for all beings. And the truth is that the benefit is and it extends beyond uh, this sense of self, which is a nothing but a delusion. Goodness leads to happiness. Uh, generosity leads to happiness and peace and well-being and so we can certainly benefit um, others through our good acts, our good intentions and especially through our good practice working with the defilements uh, with the intention of letting go of suffering and moving towards greater peace and happiness. Um, I think it's an automatic process you know that the benefit extends to others but we can certainly bring particular people to mind and very consciously practice loving kindness towards them and do good acts practice well and dedicate the benefits of our lives um, share the merits of our lives with them yeah i'd encourage you to do that it's certainly a good way to encourage us in our practice and it may well be a source of great blessing for all beings. I feel that is the case. Yeah, and hopefully there'll be a good outcome for the situations of others. It's, uh, it's tough, isn't it, to see others in difficult situations and to wish to help. Uh, and there's, in a way, we can say yes, in all the ways I've just talking about we can definitely uh, make efforts to support others through our good practice but in a way also we can ex appreciate you know that we can't necessarily um, make it okay for everybody we can certainly try we can try to I think most significantly most usefully we can try and make it good here and there'll be this good influence in the world but you know sometimes we see other suffering and we you know we're limited uh, it's limiting how much we can actually do to make things right for them and um, so i just want to bring in that um, it's very helpful for us to do our best and also to appreciate that all beings you know are the owners of their karma so everyone has their journey, everyone has their uh, work to do in a way um, to liberate themselves and some people are really motivated to do this work and others are not and we can't you know, make other people practice, we can't make them want to live entirely wholesome lives or to liberate their hearts from suffering 
um, that's up to them. And as the Buddha said, you know, um, he himself said, I can only point the way. I can't, uh, <laughs> I can't liberate you all. Um, I can only, I can only liberate myself and tell you how uh, you can make the effort, practice the Eightfold Path and find your way to liberation. So, you know, <clears throat> yeah, uh, uh, we would, of course, we'd all wish that uh, may all beings um, find Nirvana, may all beings uh, let go into Nirvana, may all beings be free from all suffering. Um, but we can't make that happen. And then this reflection on karma and how all beings are, you know, the owners of their karma and they, they are the ones who can free themselves. Um, in a sense, and speech is a bit confusing, but you know, it's it's a, the, the effort needs to be made where the suffering is, and we can't we can't um, our agency is limited to this experience here, um, but we can through reflecting on karma we can definitely develop this beautiful quality of upekka of equanimity. And this is really up called for uh, when it comes to uh, seeing the suffering in the world around us and how we can relate to that skillfully. Uh, upeka, equanimity, the willingness to be very intimately engaged and involved in the world but without allowing ourselves to be overwhelmed, swept away, caught up in suffering. Um, you know, the, the ability to be calm, steady and unshaken by circumstance. This is a very important aspect of practice for us. It's a, the ultimate um, liberation factor. And it develops through practice. It surely does, doesn't it? Through our own uh, experience, we develop equanimity towards our own defilements, our own difficulties um, so that we gradually are able to move towards greater peace in our being but also in relation to what we see around us um, this quality can be so so helpful so so i'd say you know, make merit for others practice well and dedicate your efforts to others practice loving kindness towards others but also observe you know that uh, you know people have their own journeys and they're not always going in the direction that we would wish for them and in this case uh, in these cases it's really helpful to consider the beautiful quality of equanimity and let the loving kindness and equanimity kind of work together you know this very benevolent beautiful way of seeing the bigger picture with kindness so I hope that's helpful, Susan. Thank you for your question. Okay. Mm. Yeah, thank you, Rick. That's a really wonderful observation that you shared here. I'd like to read it out. Um, Rick says, yeah. He's grown more mindful of impermanence due to living with chronic illness and pain. Um, yeah, when working, pain and exhaustion grows, so I rest. However, when I rest too long, pain and stiffness grows. Look, that's really, uh, you yeah. know, I have a lot of heart for that. Uh, and Rick asks, how do we skillfully honor impermanence when facing the future? When making an emergency preparedness kit or preparing for difficult times. Yeah, thank you for that, Rick. Um, for share. Um, it's for many people nowadays, isn't it? With climate change, the climate emergency that we're all beginning to open up to. Um, it's not really going to get any better. Things are going to get more difficult for us, and we have risks of fires and floods and so forth. Well, I don't know actually if you're referring to that, Rick, but it's what comes to my mind when you talk about an emergency preparedness kit. Um, yeah, when we're preparing um, and assuming, taking responsibility really for the possibility that you know we may need to flee, we may need to 
be ready for some sort of disaster that could be coming our way. Um, yeah, how do we how do we how do we work with that? Well, certainly, appreciation of change is is a helpful way to just open to the challenge of that kind of situation to recognize that yeah this life is really um, unpredictable this world is really unstable um, there's nothing in this world that's really safe for me there's nothing for anybody here that is a kind of refuge where can I take refuge and I would say to um, consider ways to support this kind of challenge um, of uncertainty and of potential danger is to you know recognize the refuges that we do have refuge in Buddha you know, refuge in awareness being awake to reality refuge in Dhamma in reality itself and truth and the teachings of the Buddha and refuge in Sangha you know the community that we can help each other as human beings that we have noble beings in this world who are teachers and guides for us and who we we can turn to and seek, you know, support and guidance. So these these are true refuges for us. And uh, I think when we face times of danger or potential danger, then this really becomes more apparent to us, doesn't it? And, and we can actually strengthen our sense of, well, where do I find any sense of security? Not in worldly things, for sure. Um, but there are these spiritual qualities and truths that we can take take heart and uh, we can allow ourselves to lean on in a way, you know, look to for support, uh, we can rely upon. We can actually also rely upon an each of you know, we can rely upon the truth of impermanence. That's a, a great support in its own way because it just opens the eyes in these ways I've described it from the sutta from the words of the Buddha you know it opens our eyes we can see more clearly we're coming out of ignorance we're letting go of desire and aversion when we take refuge in this perception of change this reality of impermanence so just some thoughts there we hope that they may be helpful thank you for bringing in your question here and I just missed one from Amaranta. Amaranta. Is it normal that when we're in the daily life, if we're having some fun or excitement, like having a dinner with relatives, thinking about impermanence, suddenly sadness appears? Thank you, Amaranta. Um, I appreciate that because I think there's a certain truth in that. Uh, it can be that when we are having a peak moment, you know, lovely times, and we remember that they're not actually going to last, then it can bring its a poignant sense of perhaps sadness and perhaps a more somber mood uh, can come in. Um, you know, I think in a way that probably happens for many people quite naturally without any kind of, you know, uh, particular way of contemplating. It's just a very natural uh, occurrence that can can be there for people because we know the truth that we know it's obvious in a way isn't it for anyone who just pays attention to the concept it's obvious that things are changing all the time i think this sadness is a kind of a spiritual sadness that can be a benefit for us because it's the kind of sadness that is based on reality it's um sadness of waking up to the way things are and in this way I, I feel um, you know it, it could be it can be a kind of something to not dismiss or want to move away from but rather just to really investigate um, yeah what, why is this feeling here well yes um, this is true uh, there is a poignancy in every happy occasion and um, just to investigate further and see where it takes you recommend that so rather than yeah feeling it's it's a problem actually let it be a spiritual opportunity and opening for you thank you for that though. it's a very <laughs> very real experience isn't it and, uh, I appreciate it. Um, you know, it's helpful to share because I expect that we've all had this kind of experience and it's good to reflect upon it 
actually come out of. Um, oh, time's up. Uh, let me see if there's anything else I can address quickly before we finish. Um, okay, so <laughs> that's brilliant. So thank you. So it says, I, uh, do you think a person, when they get the dedication of merit from us, this being a situation that they're in, when they get the dedication of merit, is itself a product of their own good karma. <laughs> I really like that. Um, yeah, I guess so. I mean, the Buddha did say, uh, as I'm sure you know, that if we try to figure out and understand the way things have come, you know, we're just going to get very confused and <laughs> we can get a bit tangled up, you know, with this sort of cause and effect. But yeah, absolutely. The things that happen to people, you can say they're karmic. Um, they are due to causes, and indeed we, we can actually kind of improve in a way the karma of ourselves for sure, and also the karma of others if we wish them well. Oh, we're, we're improving their karma. How wonderful is that? <laughs> we're putting in some good causes for them, we're putting in some good energy, and this is something to really celebrate. Sangha, you know, we can really help each other along the path in this way of supporting one another, of encouraging one another. Um, let's always, when we can, friends, you know, take the opportunity to help others along on the spiritual path without any sense of, you know, trying to control or uh, in any way patronise or have any sense of superiority, but rather, is there an opening for some good dharma? Wherever there's an opening for some good dharma and good spiritual support, let's step into that and take that opportunity to improve the the, the world improve the situation for, for ourselves and for others. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that. So, okay, uh, just see if there's anything else. Um, thank you for your comment, Rick. And, uh, yeah, thank you, Rick. Thank you. Um, also, Amanda. And so, bless you all. Um, really appreciate your questions. I always find it very rich actually to to meet uh, in this way, even when not, I'm not looking at you, but your kindness in contributing in this way to this session is much appreciated. So thanks for the wonderful questions. Thanks everybody for being here and good, good wishes to you all. Take care.